we can start. Well, thank you all for joining us for a session about piracy. We've been talking all days about all the new possibilities and the you know new options for leaks and all kinds of OTT offerings and services and everything around them. It's an interesting business and there's people in the world that agree with that and that steal the content or make their own businesses around it. We're going to talk about this. I'm going to briefly introduce our panel and then we'll have one video before we dive into the discussion. We have Oliver Primbramski of the DFL, this is the Deutsche Fußballliga, over here. We have Simon Hanna of Friends and Yet, right here. Dusko Matic of the United Group at the very end. Juan Olga of La Liga on my right, and Jesus Izquierdo of Intertrust. And Intertrust brings us this nice video. There we go. such a big topic. Um, I have five people on the panel are very knowledgeable about it. I'm going to ask questions two by two, I'm not going to ask every question to every person. And I want to start with the rights owners. So DFL and La Liga, what kind of piracy do you see? Just really briefly, what is the kind of piracy you see happening in the world right now? Uh, Hello. <laughs> uh, it's you're on this side. So here you are. Our rights owners here, protect us. There you go. So let's, yeah, okay, it's already working, so, sorry. So um, from the um, piracy perspective, essentially we have three different pillars. Um, the piracy is happening on social media, where what we call the indirect devaluation of our media rights. So basically uh, fans sharing their content or professional piracy advertising their services. And then we have two other big pillars, which are the main piracy aspects from our perspective. That's one is uh, the web streaming, which is essentially advertised based or advertised based revenue income for the pirates uh, combined with malware. And then we have the biggest block, what we call the IPTV services offering. So that's essentially bundling thousands of TV channels, linear channels into one packages and then 
competing directly to any of the legal offerings with essentially the same infrastructure. So the pirates who, which are organized uh, in that area are really behind that are organized crimes, uh, are groups behind that, uh, different groups are organizing it for the, uh, stealing the content source available, making the distribution available, running the hotline services and all that stuff, making credit cards, uh, in insurance and all that, all that stuff, essentially really the same, same principles as any of the legal services that's from our perspective would be and, the biggest. And for, the, for the consumer, it's not clear that it's Exactly. I mean, for as a con consumer, some some of these services are really appear to be legit services, even though you can ask yourself, well, if a, let's say if you have a normal uh, pay subscription uh, offer, which is roughly about 30 euros, and then as over all of a sudden you're paying 10, 10 euros per month for 2,500 channels, uh, it can't be legit. But that's a real business. That's a real business for the people running it. Do you see other forms? Um... Yeah. I agree totally with Oliver. We see these types of parsi as the main kind of parsi that are affecting us. Then I can add you, uh, I can add more types that we are seeing in other regions of the world. But yes, we are, we have a big concern regarding IPTVs. And, and this is a personal view, but you know, the users are, you know, paying for this and they are choosing an illegal source to consume our content. And, and that's something very dangerous for, for the whole industry. It's not just about football, because in IPTV, you can find TV channels, cinema, uh, whatever you want. Yeah, it goes right through the whole industry. But but um, what other kinds of privacy? So this... Well, we can mention also the mobile applications that are downloaded to the devices of the so users. Just apps. With, apps yeah. Typical apps, exactly. Yeah. And then we also see parsi in marketplaces that we are acting against parsi in marketplaces, the announcements that are offering devices or services. So we are removing this. And in other, other parts of the world, you can see also cable operators that are still operating. So actual cable operators, ISPs, exactly. just getting the service exactly. of the end user. But then they pay for it or is it advertising yeah, they based? Pay they pay for it. Okay. Okay. So it's a little bit the same, but then on cable. Okay. So... What are, and I'm going to ask Simon about this, uh, friends and peers, what are the ways you can uh, solve this? What are the ways you can fight? Privacy? Well, um, first of all, I'd say it's it's a disruption game. It's There is no magic bullet, silver bullet that would just remove all the problem. And one of the challenges we face, or um, content owners face as well, is people actually taking the lead and using the tools that are available, um, that are available now, um, because they're holding off, because this won't fix all the problem. No, it won't fix all the problem, but you have to disrupt to the point where you know you, you degraded the pirate offer into the point where it's just not viable anymore. People just won't put up with it. But the tools we do offer, though, there's a range. First of all, you have to monitor for the pirate content. Uh, you have to know what's out there, where it is, uh, how much of it is there. And it, it ultimately, it gives you intelligence and lets you understand the scale of the problem. But also based on that, you can uh, initiate legal enforcement. And when we say legal enforcement, we're not talking immediately about going knocking on people's doors and dragging them away. We're talking about sending them takedown notices at massive scale, millions and tens of millions of notices um, to pirate services. These are infringing services. Um, some will comply. The majority won't comply, obviously, but you have to send the notices because if you don't and you ever want to prosecute somebody, the judge will say, did you tell them to stop? Well, yes. So the, the first tool is ask them to stop. Yes, and so will, find, but find the piracy and enforce against it. Part of the discovery process, though, is um, uncovering all the network forensics. Where is the content? Not just what does it look like and what quality is it, but where is it being served from? You know, what, what infrastructure is it being hosted on and delivered through? So particularly in the live environment, very quickly after sending a takedown notice for a service, you then escalate to the infrastructure providers. So if they're hosting on AWS, for instance, you go immediately to AWS and say, this is pirate, they will take it down straight away. And the goal is ultimately to drive them onto lesser tier three infrastructure that can't scale in the same way. Um, but eventually, you know, the, the motivated paying pirates will end up on what we call fully non-compliant infrastructure. So you send the notices, but that's really as far as you'll get for legal notices. Beyond that, then, we um, you need more enhanced tools to get a result, which in summary, without going into great detail, are things like what we call dynamic real-time delivery server blocking. So build on that monitoring intelligence to work through a legal jurisdiction um, to implement through the ISPs a much more sophisticated level of blocking than traditional DNS blocking would give you. You're focusing on the delivery servers, you're focusing on the IP addresses, and potentially you're blocking 
you know, our biggest content owners like the Premier League who we work with, tens of thousands of IP addresses during game time for anyone in a particular country like the UK trying to get access to any of those servers, they're blocked by the ISPs. And that will affect more than 95% of the population. So that's a relative heavy hammer, um, but it's been very effective and it's growing in popularity around the world. The other approach we offer is something called, and lots of other vendors offer actually, is something called subscriber level identification, also known as watermarking. So instead of just going around whacking the pirate services over the head, trying to get them to stop, you identify the source of that content, assuming it's being securely delivered to an end device and it's not going out for free, the content is being restreamed from the device. So you identify which legitimate account is restreaming the content. Yeah. Yeah. And you take them out so the pirates lose their source. So you have to have tools to be able to find the content that's being sent out there. You have legal measures, but then you also have all kinds of technical ways of blocking things. And the more advanced versions are that you can do this on the spot and very quickly. And you know, it's, it's a technically yeah. not... This is, this, is, yeah. this is a sports event. Live sports is where the value is, as we know. And so to be really effective, you have to be able to do things quickly. So you need very joined up solutions that can just automate from step to step to step to get rapid results and rapid rapid action and effect. Now, just go, you have 60 channels to protect as well. So um, what what do you do? And then we'll come to Intertrust as well, but. Right, well, so uh, I work for United Media, which is a media branch within the United Group. And, uh, United Group is the largest telecom provider in Southeastern Europe. And we have 60, about 60 channels and our own production of uh, TV shows, uh, TV series, movies. So we cover wide range of intellectual property, which needs to be protected for well abuse of various infringers online and live sports events or protection of live events uh, while it is happening is uh, essential parts during, like Sam says, the value, uh, the value of the event and the value of the right uh, expires after the event. So it has to be a swift reaction has to be efficient in order to have suitable uh, way to protect the investment in those. So among our channels, we have premium sporting channels that, that uh, cover sports events. And as a, as a right holder who acquires these rights, we are very much interested to have uh, protection of abuse of, uh, well, dissipation of value when it comes to the production and distribution of this kind of content online. So we have our own in-house team that are dealing constantly with the protection of uh, intellectual property rights, but we also collaborate with uh, various third parties, with international organizations, some of which are presented here on, on this panel. And we are, of course, eager to collaborate with anyone were willing to put efforts in of diminishing this dark uh, market, which is thriving, I would say, in the last couple of years, the last decade. Yeah. And, and if you look at the 60 channels that you have in, in the live sports content, do you have a feeling where those pirates are? Are they within your own region? Are they outside of it? Are they, what kind of organizations are they? Right, well, there are different kinds of, of piracy organizations. Uh, Within our work, we kind of identify pirates that are more locally based, uh, usually based on the content they provide, what they put forward as, a, as a, what is most appealing to their audience. And then we get investigate further, et cetera, to go up to actual uh, responsible individuals. But we also, and I think this is a matter for any market, uh, the global access to uh, illegal streaming allows any market to be penetrated by international Anybody. organized mm -hmm. groups and they are quite well intertwined connected and this is not a local operation by any means any local pirate will uh, acquire content that goes beyond their own market and this in turns uh, in turn leads to these offerings of 2500 channels which no legal operator will offer within yeah. one market so it's both local and international it is available uh, well everywhere it doesn't really respect the boundaries of uh, any country or a specific market. Now, going to uh, Jesus from Intertrust, I mean, you work together uh, with friends yes, to, to protect rights. I mean, since you are in this field, are there a few large private groups out there that run this business or are there thousands and thousands and thousands of them? I'm just wondering because it's a real industry. 
with customer service and subscriptions and you know that there, there's a real industry there but is it an industry of a few or is it an industry of many 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 I would say this is um, um, uh, industry of the many, right? So piracy is um, is, is well uh, spread in in multiple countries. In every country, there is uh, many people uh, uh, doing piracy. Um, at, uh, so I would say it's very granular, right? So also there is a big group that probably uh, consolidates um, multiple uh, piracy sources into one service and even monetize it. I would say this is a yeah, it's an industry with many, many uh, people around. That's a, that's probably more. Um, um, uh, I'm pretty sure operators are more familiar with with this because they are really they are front on 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 fighting this. But but uh, yeah, I would say this pretty much uh, very very granular. Yeah. And and you work with really big companies, uh, Paramount, Tencent, uh, Disney, and so forth. Um, so what exactly do you do to protect it? What which tools do you offer? Okay. Yeah, we provide actually uh, uh, 360 uh, security solutions for, for media, right? So um, the, the needs for security on media companies actually are right now uh, pretty much diverse. So, and they come from uh, preventing illegal access, which is the conditional access, which has been working for, for, for many years. Um, um, then there is the um, anti-piracy uh, uh, protection, which uh, already Simon explained uh, very well. Uh, now that that most of the media companies have already implemented some uh, content protection uh, in, in in some way, uh, now there is another threat which are coming, which are um, the um, uh, hacking uh, the application. So whenever you build an application for iPhone or Androids. Uh, if this application is not properly uh, developed, tested, and um, according to certain standards, there is a likelihood that people can hack those applications, access your customer data. And uh, this actually can be a risk even higher than just uh, uh, having an, uh, an illegal access to your content. So this is another, this is another activity what we are right now working with, with, many, with many operators. And um, and uh, the, uh, even right now, probably the last the last thing we're working is we are working uh, with is uh, protection of the of the NFT. So right now, you probably heard about this is a scandal that happened a few months ago that people that had invested an uh, incredible amount of money into into NFTs suddenly discovered realized that uh, they had no 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 any way of protection and the content can be. Uh, manipulated access and duplicated. And so we do as well, uh, very recently, um, uh, we have developed an NFT platform that actually in addition to the to the, to the classical um, uh, features, uh, uh, smart contracts, trading and so forth, we act, uh, also protect the content, uh, the NFT uh, essence against uh, duplication. Yeah, just, just, right. So you, you have an NFT platform uh, to help content owners offer reliable NFTs to their audience, or you have an NFT platform to connect uh, copyrighted material to a certain blockchain and make sure that it's trackable and traceable? No, we, pro we provide uh, the platform uh, itself, respecting, uh, uh, providing even respecting the branding that the operator or the, or the right holder has uh, uh, with the, um, let's say with the, um, uh, and, and, and the add-on compared with the traditional or the established NFT platforms that we also protect the content. Okay. Uh, using actually a, a technology which is pretty similar to the DRM, to the digital rights management, actually we call it token rights management, it's relatively similar, but this uh, in the same way that DRM prevents uh, people to, to, to illegally access or, or manipulate the content, uh, uh, this technology uh, prevents people to access and manipulate the NFTs. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now we have content out there and there's something of course very specific about live sports content uh, as compared to Hollywood movies or anything else uh, that's copyright protected and an interesting uh, target for pirates because it is live, the value of the content goes down the hour, the match or the race or whatever has stopped. So getting there is very difficult. We have technical tools, we've heard of them tracking tools, finding out, sending these letters, but there's also a whole policy framework. And I would like to ask Oliver to explain a little bit what is happening in Europe in that field, because it's 
you, you, if you find something that's illegal, it's not like you, you can file a police report and then they will put them in jail. It doesn't work like this, right? Yeah, unfortunately not. Yeah, <laughs> it, it would be easy if that would be uh, that that easy. Um, yeah, that I mean, that's that's really one of the biggest challenges we are facing, right? I mean, time is of the essence for any any sports events. I mean, in our case, of course, I mean it's ninety minutes we have, and uh, what we are requesting for the European Union, for example, is roughly to have a legislation in place where any um, illegal content should be removed in, in it within 30 minutes uh, from the hosting provider once we notify them of the discovery of the and illegal content. And the hosting content. provider would be an ISP or a cable operator or an OTT platform? Yeah, or yeah, in, in that instance, it will be really about the hosting provider. So essentially the one who's operating the streaming server offering the illegal content. I mean, that would be the one which we are, we are notifying and what, what we are already doing. But as uh, as the colleagues already explained, that uh, these guys are running what we call non-compliant platforms. So of course, they are not reacting to any of the compliances or to the reports, to the takedown notices. And what we are asking, uh, and we just recently, a couple of days ago, we uh, made a call to action to the European Commission uh, with over 110 companies uh, signing a letter uh, where we requested um, to have this legislation in place or at least to have that put in back into the a European Commission workbook for 2023, uh, because that's also a request from the European Parliament, which is supporting our request uh, for the live industry. And, that's, and to be clear, it's not only about sports industry, it's also about the creativity industry, the culture industry, for example, for live content. Uh, uh, they are say, facing. What is in place now? What happens now? On well, now, it's uh, it really depends uh, essentially at the end of the day of the local legislation uh, and the, the local judge uh, what they decide and how they would like to react, and that's that's one of the problem. And also, the other problem is uh, let's say of the importance or the recognition of the importance, because still. Uh, a lot of the law enforcement and uh, officials are still believe, let's say, uh, that uh, the digital piracy for live sports or for any live co uh, content is still irrelevant. It is not providing any real damage to the economy, to the to to the government, and all that stuff. And therefore, it's let's say from the priority a little bit lower than let's say a drug dealing or terrorism or anything else. But at the end of the day, and that, that's a very important point, we need to realize that the guys behind running these services are the, 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 the is organized crime and they're financing drug services, they're financing um, a really it's a very sense. shady world that's yeah. involved in that. But also, I mean, I, I can imagine that there's no judge anywhere that would love to get uh, you know, 35 takedown request on Saturday evening during the match. And, you know, th this is not a workable format, right? So it has to be sort of an automatic uh, takedown and not a legal intervention takedown. Exactly. I mean, that, that that would be the optimal goal. And that's what one one of the things we are requesting as well, that there are some sort, that's what we call an API or whatever it is, where we can notify as a trusted flagger to these hosting providers and they will react on that. Because this model is exactly what we have with the social media platforms, what we call the compliant platforms, like YouTube, Facebook, and all the other guys who are either way using automatic contact recognition tools to discover illegal content because they know what the watermarking is, they know what our content is, they know or we know who, who we license our content. And if it's not the partner on their platform, then it's legal content. So it will automatically, I mean, if you stream a yeah. you know, big match on YouTube, it will automatically, automatically, automatically discover it. Or if it's not discovered, we can flag that as a trusted flagger to them and then they will remove it immediately. You won't even look at it, they will just do it. Exactly, and that's exactly. And that, that's a very important thing is about uh, we need to educate uh, the politics and the law uh, lawmakers essentially in each of each of the reasons that we're not talking about freedom of speech. We're talking about theft. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's a criminal activity. I think for La Liga, it's even a little bit different because, of course, a uh, huge company. You have your own tools for tracking and tracing and taking it down. And of course, you're also part of a telecom group, so you can also do a lot yourself. Can you explain a little bit what the strategy of La Liga is here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, basically, we we base our fight against bars in four pillars: the, the legal pillar, the communication pillar, related to the, the thing that was explained by Oliver to educate to discourage the consumption of bars. Also, the lobbying pillar, which is related to uh, having more conversations with the policymakers, obtaining better regulations, and of course, the technology for which it, for us is is key in the fight against piracy. Uh, we have our own laboratory in Madrid, um, composed by experts in this area. 
And we have some well-known tools, uh, which are Marauder, Marauder, Lumiere, Black Hole. All of them have different, um, let's say, um, aims or goals. They were designed for attacking piracy in social media platform, for investigating IPTV uh, platforms too, etc. So we are developing our tools and, and related to the, the previous topic, um, meanwhile, uh, we are expecting new and better regulations. We, we attack piracy by means of court uh, orders and, and blocking injunctions. And fortunately in Spain now we have a, a very important blocking injunction, which basically consists in La Liga uh, sending to the ISPs, I mean, the, the internet service. So you players. have what, what was just described. Exactly. You ask it, it's stopped immediately. Exactly. Yeah. exactly, but it's true. For us, it's very important and it's very useful, but it's only for Spain. Yeah. And Paris is global. So yeah. that's why Oliver was right it's saying that- for Europe to start with, but it is global. Yeah. Rule, because it's not just about Spain, it's about all the countries. But, but as a model, it's interesting that, you know, the um, usually, getting uh, firm involved to track and trace and do all the work uh, costs a lot of money, of course, because the tools are not free. But uh, you basically also made it into a service that you offer to others as well. So, so you made it into a revenue center instead of a cost center, right? Because they will help uh, fund and support uh, the further development of those tools. Yeah, exactly. So, so other leagues can come to you in Spain, of course. Well, in Spain and outside of Spain, I mean, now we are collaborating with many other leagues. Probably you know about uh, the Jupiler Pro League, which is the Belgium League, uh, Dorna Sports with charter organizers of uh, MotoGP, for example. But then we are collaborating in South America with many others. This is based on a, another pillar that is like a philosophy for us at La Liga, which is uh, to share and to join uh, efforts when we talk about fighting piracy. It's yeah. crucial for us to cooperate and work together and together we we have a united media and bundesliga which is our, our very yeah, good example of this because everybody we, here seems to work together in some way yeah we, we share yeah. many <laughs> yeah. forums spaces and and we also in our case we conducted uh, actions against piracy in the past together so for us it's crucial to cooperate and that's why la liga now is uh, well cooperating with other rights yeah. owners and right holders are out there in the fight against sports. Yeah, it's bringing the whole industry together. I want to go back to Simon. I mean, some examples were already given of, you know, this legacy that needs to change, there's tech tools. Can you describe a little bit how, how, the, region, how the regional differences? Because it's very different from area to area what works, right? Uh, not so much what works. I mean, the, the problems are different in different regions and you know, we see more on a um, insecure OTT delivery in North America at this point because some of those platforms are still first generation and they, they need to mature and how they... They suffer from the legacy networks they have and then they... Um... Well, just the legacy platforms, they were early OTT platforms. They weren't really built with security in mind and again, they're easily compromised and that's always going to be a pirate's first choice. It doesn't cost anything to access that content and indeed the service provider will pay the distribution costs. So they, they don't have to capture it and forward it on because it's exposable. Um, see APAC, we see you know, the marketplace in Singapore with lots of pre-packaged boxes available on the market store, which will get you these IPTV services, but ultimately they're offering the same services, they're closed to IPTV services. Um, but those services are, are global, and again, the, the content's available globally, and if you're paying your $10 a month for your 2,500 channels, you're getting everything. You know, whether you want Australian sport or not, you're getting it with South African, with Canadian, American, Brazilian, it's all there. You know, um, So, that it is fairly universal. I was just adding on to you know, Oliver was talking about the with the hosting providers as well. It's worth saying, you know, the big guys do a pretty good job. If you if we identify or you know any, you guys identify anything that's um, linking back to hosting infrastructure on AWS, you tell tell it AWS they'll take it down because we have relationships with them. They know us, they trust us, and they give us tools to report these things. Um, they aren't really the problem, you know. The, it's the it's a lot of the guys in the middle who say they're compliant, but it takes them two days to respond. And know, then, the, then the value's gone. And... Yeah, they, they don't look at it till the Monday, um, or they say we have to get our lawyer to look at every single request. You know, they, they're living in the past, and um, partly because they can't be bothered, but partly because they think they're like you say, defending free speech in some way. Um, they just don't want to get involved in the problem. Then you get the pure non-compliant guys, and. All right, if they're outside of the European jurisdiction, so be it. But a lot of them are, you know, 
Fraser League front and center, you know, hanging out in Amsterdam. What are you going to do, guys? How are you going to stop us? And so that's where we need regulation to make it obligatory because, again, what AWS are doing ultimately is voluntary. They don't have to do it, but they're doing the right thing. And so everyone else has to be made to do the right thing because it's all the said it's theft. Social is another problem in that YouTube and Facebook, they offer rights manager, they offer content ID, and these are, these are good tools. They do a decent job, but they're not available to all. It's the problem they have. They can't scale beyond, you know, they have to trust that when Oliver comes along and says, this is DFL content, I own it. They have to trust you do. Because um, if they allow me as an individual to register for a live content ID and I come along starting to claim um, you know, a Bundesliga match, then we've got problems. Um, so they, they, it, they don't it, have I a mean, scale model right now. And that's what it sounds doable to make a register of all the, I mean, even the smaller ones. You could, you could make a list. Well, that's, that's, what, that's what the EU is currently trying yeah. to work out. Is it Makes technically sense. feasible? Well, and there are lots of reasons why it's going to be very, very difficult. Okay. Okay. Um, Region-wise, is, is there something specific going on in your uh, neck of the woods? I mean, is there more privacy, you think, than elsewhere or less? I would say, I would say the piracy in general has risen, uh, especially during COVID and after the COVID, I mean, the, the trend goes on. Uh, the piracy in general is growing in, in constantly. So I wouldn't say it's, it's uh, different in any region. Every region is affected. There are differences in different region markets, the way the institutions treat the problem, the way the, the you know, the piracy itself is perceived as, as Oliver says, is it uh, comparable to another form of organized crime? But actually it is an organized crime that needs to have proper response from uh, authorities. So in the region that we, where we operate on a, on a kind of a local uh, approach, differences are mostly a result of different responses from different institutions. So different market has more aggressive stance uh, the different countries have more aggressive stance towards piracy, therefore different ways that pirates are actually behaving as a response to that. And I would say that we have noticed quite a difference in, in the way that pirates market themselves, approach customers, some are more... What, what is the difference? What is changing? Well, in some markets, in some countries, you know, they, they perceive that... Uh, that, well, there is no consequences for what they're doing. Therefore, they are free, free to openly advertise their services. And even if the institutions get them in a way that the consequences of the punishment will not be as severe. So therefore, it doesn't really have incentive for them to stop. It is a profitable market. They are. Has any of you ever put someone in jail or at least the fine? I mean, yeah, you, did you put someone in jail? Yeah, we did. Okay, good. And, and but, but to be clear, we only we are only going, and that, that that's very important. We are we are not going after the fans or someone who is let's say enjoying the content, right, or enjoying the atmosphere, enjoying the sports. We're really going after the guys who are making business with it or organized it. That's what we're after, and that's where we're putting them into jail. It's, it's not just taking stuff down; it's actually. Yeah, like, likewise, our biggest customers are well. Two of our biggest customers are Premier League and Sky. And they are very aggressive on this and they will, you know, we find people, they will prosecute them as, you know, to the full extent of the law. And you know, we're talking fines potentially of hundreds of thousands of pounds and jail terms. Yeah, put them out of business and, yeah. Um, if, the, if you look at the, the cooperation within the industry, you know, as policymakers, there's rights owners, there's broadcasters, there's an incredible role for the ISPs and the service providers and the cloud companies. What is the, at the moment, the, the hardest part of the chain to track them? I mean, where is it really difficult? It's not the end users, right? I mean, from Intertrust, where, where do you think like, okay, here we have to develop something new because this part escapes us right now, or this is where um, they found a new loophole because, you know, they're clever entrepreneurs. So it's a difficult question. Um... It's uh, more difficult. It's always the new, right? Because the the uh, the um, technology consolidates along the time. And right now, uh, for example, a few a few years ago, uh, the digital rights management seems to be like uh, like rocket science, right? So 
uh, nobody knew how, how actually it worked. Right now, most of the people is familiar with uh, the DRM, right? So right now, I would say the the, the challenge right now is to uh, okay, what's the next? And uh, and right now, the next is, uh, for example, the as I was as I was mentioning before, uh, application protection. So that's uh, uh, it's, it's what uh, in which we are working right now. It's probably right now the 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 uh, the most relevant part, and also the NFTs. I would say it, it, it's starting, so we are now investigating that. We are giving the solutions uh, because the technology, which is already established, is now working well. It's, uh, it's, it's right now even a commodity in most of the cases. So I would say this is the this is the area where you're still developing. You, you say it's the hard part, but this is also the good one. So we are here trying to to, to solve those those problems that that arise all the time. I don't know if this answered your question. No, I'm, I'm just really curious. I mean, I, I have the feeling that also with this new layer over the internet, with much more decentralized services, you know, we'll see what comes of it. Uh, it's going to be easier and harder to track what's going on. And it's really hard to track what's going on in tele Telegram channels, for instance, who can have thousands and thousands of people on them. So that is that is a problem, yeah. The, the closed internet, the private internet is a problem. Just Not just really for sharing content, for sharing links to content, information and content, because you know, as monitoring parties, we're out there trying to find the content as well. So what you might want to do as a wannabe part consumer, we're doing it times 100, 24 hours a day, you know, both manually, but heavily automated as well. In some places you just can't go. And we talk about the closed IPTV services, they're a particular challenge because it's not just a case of always signing up, giving your credit card details, your PayPal account, whatever it is, and getting access to the content. You have to do a lot of social engineering to get access to somebody who will know somebody who get you an account. And then you need to do that multiple times because like I said earlier, you can't just have one account downloaded 24 hours a day. You're pretty obviously you know, not in their best interest at that point, so they'll shut you down. So you, it takes a lot of time and effort and expense to actually be able to monitor those services. And again, they are wholly non-compliant services. They will not stop. So you, you, they need to apply the other tools on top to actually use technology to have a real impact against them. Questions from the audience. It's a big problem, and there's a lot of angles to it. Did I see a question there? Oh, no, it's a new stretch in his head. Anybody want to? Yes, question here in front, please. Thank you for sharing this insight. I have one question which is linked to the current context. Do you see an increase of piracy when the economical situation is getting you know, troubled like these days? Like, you know, people obviously there is inflation, et cetera. So there might be a kind of push for them to uh, go to piracy or there is no correlation. Who sees the direct results of the, I mean, I think in the Netherlands, the electricity bills came in and people started, you know, unsubscribing for lots of services. They are logical uh, targets, of course. In our case, I mean, this is the perspective from, from our rights owner, but when we talk about piracy, we just see a crime. So we don't try to link the commercial things with piracy. I mean, we we just have the objective to attack piracy straightforward because we are talking about a crime. The pirates are stealing our content. And, and in such regard, we don't try to link, you know, the, the, the economic situation, the local situation for a particular country with that. But my question is not exactly that. My question is, as Monique said, you, you might have people just unsubscribing to legal packages. Then they have two options, stop watching, because they don't want to subscribe anymore to the legal packages, or they go back to piracy if they have done that before, or they go to piracy yeah. because they want still to watch, but they cannot afford that. So do you see, kind of, you know, in the past, I don't know, 12 months, a surge in, in terms of, for instance, the, the anti-piracy company, do you see a surge in terms of number of potential pirates or the number of potential clients of these pirates? I, I would say it is a general truism that when times are hard, People look for cheaper ways of getting content. You know, they shut down certain options, but also then they will look at different ways of getting content. And, you know, we're all in markets where if you want everything, you have to pay quite a lot of money now. You need a lot of services. And a lot of even the more, you know, upstanding members of society, they may sign up for six services, but the seventh one is one too many. So they may think, well, actually, I want to watch that. So I'm going to get it some other way. So, but yeah, Jeff, times are tough. People don't have the money, yes. The piracy increases, yes. I would just add to that, you have an interesting situation where actually pirates are justifying their increase in prices 
because of the tough times. So pirates are saying, oh, well, we have, Inflation. To, we have to charge a little bit more because you understand it's, it's tough times. Exactly, because they're really facing the same problems like the legit services, right? I mean, they have to say, pay the same power bills. I mean, I, I, it sounds like that, you know, the the pirates, um, especially those from organized crime, they will always find a way, right? I mean, there's always a way to get, I mean, especially now that broadband up and down is available for almost anybody at relatively small prices, there's a way to get the stuff out. Yeah, that's like uh, the game of the cat and mouse, right? Absolutely. So there is new, new technology, the uh, hackers go... Uh, uh, behind the technology at some point they are able to break it so we invent a new uh, a new technology and so forth and then this is an ending an ending run i would say so 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 back a all game but nevertheless it's worth playing the game to take out at least part of that yeah well, like i said it's, it's a disruption game it's it's degrade their experience but you know the fact is any of you you know if you're a traditional satellite broadcaster and you spend 10 million dollars a year on your Conditional access provider, or whatever it costs, you know, probably quite a lot. Um, you think this is rock solid, does a great job. Fact is, I can spend five dollars on Amazon on an HDMI splitter to remove the HDCP to get that feed back into my laptop to re-encode it in seconds, and it's up on the internet. You can't stop me doing that. So you have to find me, shut me down, and shut down the service I'm giving the content to. You have to disrupt what I'm doing. Now, it's not doesn't stop at the set top box. You, know, you need anti-piracy because frankly it's not going to go away um but again if you can disrupt me or disrupt my feeds and i have to keep switching smart cards and find new ways of getting my content out and the people who are coming back late at night and not paying for the pay-per-view because they're trying to watch it on the cheap after they've had to switch six times you know and the guy who, who's responsible for sorting it out is getting beaten up you know eventually they'll pay for the legitimate service that's what you're trying to do just disrupt disrupt and disrupt yeah. did you guys never use the whatever gets pirated as a sort of market research, because it's also interesting to see what people really want to see and they go out there and they share it with each other. And there's a sort of viral, um, you know, strength to it as well, where you can say, you know, this is what people really, really want apparently. I think for all of us as monitoring businesses, certainly a growing part of what we do is business intelligence. It's, it's understanding what's out there. We are monitoring the piracy. We are looking what's out there in the scale of the theft. Um, and how it's being viewed and where it's being viewed. And a lot of what we will be offering increasingly, I think, as service providers is, is this kind of business intelligence here. One last question from the audience. So quiet. Um, the last question is really where to go from here. Well, I mean, policy might change, whack-a-mole game continues. Uh, tools for tracking, tracing, and taking down will get more and more sophisticated. What's the next wave in all this? I'm, I'm starting at the end then. What do you mean by the next wave? The next wave in uh, fighting against or the next wave what we see on a, on a trend? I'm giving up and letting it go. I don't know. What, what's the next wave? What's going to happen now? What, what do you see happening? To be honest, I don't know. No, really. I mean, it's, no, but it's, 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 we, I think we are still in such a dynamic environment and such a dynamic market for the whole media consumption and, and, and the thing. I mean, we're taking just a, little, a couple of years back. No one had have, have really thought about that. We are having our lives into a mobile device that we're consuming everything within a mobile device. And that and family would have five, six subscription exactly. services is also quite... Uh, exactly, exactly. And, and everyone, when, when the first subscription services start, would, would argue that they will fail. Now we are, we are living in a subscription world. And the question is, will we live in three years in the metaverse world or not? Or will, whatever that be, I don't know, to be honest. I really don't know. What do you think? Well, I would like to conclude with... I'm optimistic in the sense that I expect that the whole industry, I mean, the audiovisual industry in general, stands against piracy altogether and not only a few of us. So I, I expect that in, in the near future, all the industry, you know, claims for this kind of regulations and, and, and you know, actions against piracy from governments and no, the, the, the feeling of importance is so big that some cooperation yeah. on standardization in the approach might actually start to work. Yeah. Yeah. Let me start at the end there. Well, I'm not sure what will happen. I can only say what I hope that would happen. So uh, 
certainly what would industry prefer is to have harmonized efficient tool in fighting the, the piracy. Therefore, recent initiative to end live piracy now that was largely supported by European Parliament and, and uh, various industry members or rights holders, sports organizations, that should be a good uh, pointer that there is a need and there is a potential at least regulatory solution that could be offered. So I would certainly um, hope for a good efficient tool that would, from one, one hand, focus on, on a quick, efficient removal of illegal content. Also, we could talk more about uh, uh, good use of blocking injunctions that should be uh, uh, appropriated and, and, and used uh, on a larger scale, not just on a national level for those countries that actually implemented it. So that could be a very well um, well step in the, in the in a wider so scale. You're, you're right, rights. blocking uh, standards for- you know. Right, right. We have uh, uh, moved from static to more dynamic and live blocking. And that is something that is, that is effect uh, coming out of, of the need to have uh, appropriate and quick, efficient response. So initiatives to have these kind of effective tools are something that we're all hopeful and we are uh, asking for. And I think hope that we will meet, we will be meet with some appropriate response from various institutions there. Yeah, well, I agree with, you with all this. Uh, also, I wanted to, to point out that I, I see a, a big difference between the mindset right now when someone is trying to build an ODP service is that most of the most of you guys right now are thinking about uh, are thinking globally. Okay, so when you think about building an ODP service, uh, you think and reaching uh, the whole world. Uh, this is a big change because a few years ago, just people uh, wanted to build a service, you know, for Germany or for Italy or for a given country or a given region. Right now, everybody is is looking globally, which is great. Also, that makes a difference on technology wise, right? So this is one of one change that I see right now. And looking to the future, as I say, um, uh, probably the, the 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 main the main thing that at least for us as solution providers is, uh, uh, as I say, on protection of the of the data via protection of the applications to to prevent uh, to prevent hacking and uh, and. Um, and, uh, and um, this uh, pre prevent the hackers to access to, to your data, which is equally very valuable. And also the other tendency that I see as well is the uh, NFT, NFT platforms. And from our side, what uh, refers to, uh, to our side is uh, NFT protection. And uh, this is the tendency that, that I see right now in the market. That's a huge new market. Simon, last words for you. Uh, well, building on one thing that Oliver said, actually, you know, the other things we've seen recently, of course, are you know, today, travel TV, 40 channels, free sports content. There you go, guys. You know, no login, no registration, nothing. So based. there's no anti-piracy model there at all. You know, that's that's out there. Um, also, directing consumer OTT. We're seeing a lot more of this, you know, yourselves. You know. Um, lots of people at least thinking about it, you know, if not deploying it yet. Um, it's coming for so many sports properties. Um, on the anti-piracy side, though, blocking definitely, delivery server blocking is... It's a massive conversation for us and it's growing around the world. Um, it's really just being held back by regulatory authorities who who need to get their head around the scale they need to offer to those of us that are actually delivering the services because we can give tens of thousands potentially of IP addresses updating every five minutes. They have to be able to support it yeah. and accept it. Now, where it's been deployed, it works. The technology is not that difficult. You just need the regulatory yeah. um, frameworks to allow it. And then, of course, watermarking is a never-ending conversation. Um, those that have done it get huge value from it. Um, lots of other people just constantly think about it. And next year's project, next year's project, because it's the back end of security. We'll talk more next year about all this. One thing is for sure, the industry of pirates is so big, it means that there's a real need out there for more and more. So it's not it's a market, it's a market to be conquered. Get it back into the right dungeon. Thank you guys very much for this conversation. You wanted to. Yeah, just just one 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 more comment. I mean, I mean, last last comment, so to speak. I think what was also very important is roughly about the education. I mean, again, I mean, we getting.